My name is Eloise Ardley. I'm the director of UBEP, the Oxford University Business Economics Program. Although it might feel a bit early to talk about the post-crisis, we wanted to bring you the latest data and thinking from world-class economists who are working on the impact of COVID on the economy, but also looking ahead to understand what a different path to recovery look like. Our aim at UBEP is to equip business leaders with the data and the economic theory to enable you to create impact in your organizations. It's fantastic to see so many familiar names joining us this morning, but also a big welcome to anybody who's tuning in for the first time. I also want to say a big thank you to our sponsors for this series, Jason and Co. And we'll hear more from uh, Chris Roswell, the Chief Investment Officer and Managing Partner, a bit later on in the series in a very special conversation. Quick bit of housekeeping. I'm sure you're all used to the Zoom calls by now, but all participants are on mute. Please use the Q&A function to ask questions, and I will pause throughout the sessions to pass them on to Beata. We've only got one hour, so if we don't get to your questions, email us or connect, us, connect with us on LinkedIn or Twitter to carry on the conversation. So to kick us off, we are absolutely thrilled to welcome Beata Javocek, Chief Economist at the EBRD. For the UBEP alumni amongst you, you'll be very familiar with Beata as she regularly teaches on the program in the summer. For the others, Beata is an international trade economist, the first woman to be Chief Economist at the EBRD, and also the first woman to hold a statutory professorship in economics here in Oxford University. She's a former senior economist at the Development Economics Research Group of the World Bank. She's also a program director of International Trade and Regional Economics Program at the Centre for Economic Policy Research in London. She's involved in many other research and literal projects focused on international trade, foreign direct investment, investment promotion and tax evasion. Her research also explores how developing countries and transition economies are able to harness globalization, the topic of today, to stimulate the country's economic growth. So thank you very much, Beta, for starting off the UBEP year with us, and particularly this, sem this seminar series, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, Eloise. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's lovely to be back at UBEP. I've been part of UBEP for way more than a decade, so I'm sure that if I could see uh, you on my screen, there would be lots of familiar faces. So special welcome to those of you who are my former delegates from UBEP summers over the last decade or so. Let me share with you my screen. Uh, so that, that should work. So as I was saying, um, there was a lot of concern early in the pandemic um, whether globalization would be rolled back. Um, and actually, as a matter of fact, next week, I am on a panel at Virtual Davos exactly under this topic. But I would argue that globalization will not be rolled back. However, its face will change a bit. Um, I think we will no longer see the breakneck speed at which trade in goods was increasing um, in the, for instance, in the 90s. However, we may see a greater increase in exports of, of services. So I, as, uh, so as I was um, uh, mentioning, which probably you didn't hear, in my lecture, I will start with general comments about globalization in post-COVID world. Then I will cover, uh, I will say a few words about the major trade event, uh, recent trade event, Brexit. And then I will talk about topics that are much less frequently mentioned, but are going to matter for globalization, namely um, rise of state involvement in the economy in the form of state-owned enterprises, state-owned bank, and state involvement in low carbon transition. So that's the plan where we are going. Um, contrary to many expectations, international trade did not take such a big hit as many people feared last year. The latest figures are not in yet. There is always a delay um, between, um, between obtaining trade statistics um, and trade taking place. But according to the WTO, their early estimates, um, international trade in goods fell by about 9% last year. And the WTO expects a 7% increase this year. So that means that trade in goods is not going to return to pre-pandemic levels this year yet. The other piece of good news is that so far the world has managed to avoid protectionism. 
Early in the pandemic, we saw export restrictions on personal protective equipment as some European countries were seizing shipments. We saw export restrictions on food products as some emerging markets that saw their currencies weaken were concerned about inflation. So they kept, they wanted to keep food for their domestic consumers. However, these export restrictions disappeared and by and large, um, we have managed to avoid protections. Part of the reason is that the scope for tariff hikes is limited. Um, here you see the table which summarizes or illustrates this very nicely. So if you think about so-called most favored nation tariffs, so these are tariffs imposed by countries on other WTO members, you see that on average uh, this tariff is 5%. It's higher in low-income countries um, than in high-income countries, but nevertheless, the tariffs that are actually applied vis-a-vis -vis WTO members are quite low. Now note, however, that what's negotiated at the WTO is not the tariff that's actually applied, but so-called tariffs bindings. The maximum tariff a country is allowed to apply. And here, as you can see, that there is some, these bound tariffs are larger. So the space that countries have, the difference between what they committed to be the maximum tariff and what's the tariff that they actually apply, so-called tariff water, is there. There is some space there. And for instance, if you look at low-income countries, the difference between tariffs they actually apply is 36 percentage points. The tariff they apply and the tariffs they commit, committed not to exceed. However, a lot of this policy space is meaningless because it is um, many countries are engaged in preferential trade agreements, in regional trade agreements. So those agreements prevent them from using that policy space. Also, um, countries have tariffs on products that they don't import at all. So in, for those cases, increasing tariff wouldn't matter. So if you look at the meaning pol meaningful policy space, this meaningful water in the tariff, how much they could increase their tariffs, it's for at least high income countries, um, the space for maneuver is quite small, is 5%. For low-income countries, it's 25 percentage points. So there is actually room for increases. However, we have managed so far to avoid these increases, which is quite a good news. But of course, we are not out of the woods yet. And what I worry about is that as we enter the recovery phase, there may be pressure from national firms that have been weakened during the current crisis to get governments to protect them. And this protection can be done under so-called countervailing duties, which are allowed by the WTO to protect the market against surge in subsidized imports. And these days, because every government essentially is um, helping firms, it's going to be very easy to make an argument that imports that are coming um, are subsidized. So I think here um, we need some international commitment not to use those exceptions allowed by the WTO um, to avoid escalation in protectionism using countervailing duties. Now, the other um, issue that's very much on the mind of trade economists is the US-China relationship. Um, as you may recall, um, there was an agreement reached by between the Chinese government and the Trump administration where China committed to make large purchases of American goods. However, as of last December, as of actually the end of December, China purchases reached only 58% of the target that was set for last year. So it remains to be seen how the new US administration handles the relationship with China. Um, presumably, there will not be a huge change in the policy, 
but um, hopefully there will be no escalation and no outright trade war as, as we observed with China. Um, as you may know, the World Trade Organization, the global infrastructure when it comes to trading rules was weakened under the previous US administration. Um, in particular, US was blocking uh, nominations of judges to uh, who adjudicate disputes between countries. Um, now we hope that the, with the new administration, some good news will come um, to multilateral organizations such as the WTO and that the global trading infrastructure, the regulatory infrastructure is going to be strengthened and rebuilt. Now, a lot of discussions um, during last year pertained to global value chains. And in particular, early in the pandemic, um, as China was hit, particularly the, the province, province of Hubei, which is a home to a lot of high-tech exports, um, a lot of attention has been drawn um, to resilience or the lack of resilience of global value chains. I think um, this is something that will remain on the minds of firms. They will want to build resilience. Um, there has been some political pressure to bring production back, to reshore. Um, however, uh, for the most part, there is no evidence that actually reshoring has happened much. Nevertheless, if you, for instance, look at the graph here, which shows German imports from China on the horizontal axis, you see the share of German imports in particular products that come from China. On the vertical axis, you see comparative advantage in the same products of countries in the broadly defined European neighborhood. You see that there is a lot of scope for changing the supply pattern. So for instance, um, new EU member states um, can, or countries in Southern Mediterranean, such as Tunisia, um, Jordan, Cyprus, can step in and actually replace some of the Chinese suppliers. So the question is, will we see some relocation of production um, to those countries? There's certainly scope for that. I would argue that we will see some movement, some geographic reshaping of global value chains, but it's not going to happen fast. And it's not going to happen fast because even though the resilience argument is quite powerful, um, obviously, diversification of the sourcing patterns is costly. It's going to increase cost and this resilience versus cost trade-off will put a break on, the, um, on what we see. Automation will help, but automation also means that not many jobs will be brought to the new locations. Um, and you know, and the, another sort of powerful break on this process is the fact that a lot of networks, global value chains are around production networks centered on multinational firms. And because we expect FDI flows to remain subdued uh, for the next few years, as you see in this graph, UNCTAD expects global FDI flows to remain to remain below the level observed right after the financial crisis. So this is quite a significant drop that already has taken place and that is likely um, to continue. This is going to slow down this reshaping of global value chains. Um, perhaps let me skip these slides due um, to, to, to time pressure, um, and let me move in into uh, remote work, right? At the beginning of the pandemic, we have all been thrown into this giant experiment with remote working. And now that uh, many firms have crossed the psychological threshold of allowing their employees to work from home for prolonged periods of time, I think remote work is here to stay. We will see a lot of hybrid arrangements where employees show up in the office from time to time, um, but not um, every day. 
And once you move into this hybrid model, why not go a step further and hire foreign workers? So if you are a firm in London, why constrain yourself to workers in London? Or if you are a firm in, in Frankfurt, why constrain yourself to employees just in Frankfurt or even just in the UK or in Germany? Of course, there are limitations, right? It's easier um, if your employees are in the same time zone. It's easier, for instance, if they are in the European Union, if you are a German firm, because then you are subject to the same data protection regulation. It's easier if they are, for instance, within the Schengen zone, because it's easier to bring them to visit the office. Um, and I think what we are going to see is much more remote work, remote work taking place across international borders. Um, you know, we have actually globally exploited um, differences in wages of production workers. So supply chains have been set up. We have exploited um, those advantages. Services and uh, the exploiting the differential in wages of skilled workers, white collar workers, that's the new frontier. And that's where I would expect the trends to, to speed up. And again, this is an opportunity for countries that have inexpensive skilled labor. Um, this is an opportunity to export services. So it's an opportunity, if you look from the European perspective, for countries in the broadly defined European neighborhood. Another um, trend that I would expect to speed up is global cooperation on the tax front. Um, from this pandemic, pretty much every government is going to emerge indebted. Um, there will be a lot of pressure to find new sources of tax revenues. Um, taxing citizens will certainly increase and will be, by, for the most part, accepted by people as long as they perceive taxation as fair. So the pressure to um, tax multinational firms, to tax tech giants is going to increase. So I would expect to see some curbs on what in polite company is called tax management, in less polite company is called tax base erosion and profit shifting. Um, and there was a proposal made by the OECD in November 2019. It said that uh, countries could be taxing operations in their jurisdictions, even if companies have no physical presence there. There was another proposal for a global minimum tax rate. Um, I think we are going uh, to see some progress, perhaps not acceptance of those OECD proposals, but increased global cooperation. Now, let me say a few words about you know, one of the biggest trade shocks we observed um, in the last few years, um, Brexit. As you all know, as of January 1st of this year, um, UK is no longer part of single market of customs union with the EU. Um, the transition period ended and um, there is basically a looser relationship between the UK and the EU. Essentially, there is um, trade, free trade in goods is happening, but not in services. Now, I, I would argue, and, and so have many economists, that actually the impact of Brexit has already been felt before formally Brexit happened. Essentially, the Brexit referendum, which took part, um, which took place in June 2016, introduced a lot of uncertainty about future trading relationship. And uh, it already, this uncertainty already resulted, for instance, in firms delaying investment, in firms delaying entry into export markets. Here, you see the impact of that uncertainty on hiring. And in particular, um, this comes from, from my own study, you see that UK travel to work areas, which are exposed more through their employment structure to barriers on export of services, 
saw a substantial reduction in the number of online job advertisements that they have posted. Um, and in particular, um, this decline in job advertisements, so demand for labor, was visible in skilled and professional jobs. And as this graph shows, it started happening essentially um, in the second half of 2018. And this demand for, um, for labor has not recovered. And why in 2018? Well, because that was the time um, when the UK government revealed its preferred um, negotiating strategy, which said that it would negotiate free trade in goods, um, and it was seeking a looser relationship on services, um, which means rather than being part of the single market, which is the most integrated area for services trade in the world, the UK government was seeking to rely on so-called equivalence, um, mutual recognition of regulation guiding services sectors, um, and which would allow export of services to take place. Uh, if you have been following um, recent developments, such equivalence has not been granted, for instance, for financial services, uh, for legal services. And on the first trading day, um, six billion worth of stock trade moved from London um, to, to the continent. So this is actually a, um, a big shock for UK services sectors. And even though um, you may think that this affects just London, um, that is actually not the case as um, regions exposed um, to uncertainty and to those potential barriers uh, to services trade should no agreement on equivalence uh, be reached, um, these, these localities can be found throughout the United Kingdom. So it is not just um, London that's been affected. Um, Eloise, perhaps before I move to state-owned enterprises, there are some general questions. Uh, yes, there's a couple of questions on the first part of the of the sessions around uh, international trade. Why do you think international trade managed to remain resilient during this crisis? Particularly, what was the main factor? You think? So the the main factor was very aggressive fiscal and monetary policy, um, which meant that uh, countries were hit less hard um, than. Um, it would have happened in the absence of government intervention. Um, and because a lot of spending on services did not happen, so think about travel, tourism, um, people did not spend a lot of money on um, services. Those sectors and international trading services took a big hit, but people continued spending um, on goods not as much as they would have, obviously, in the absence of the pandemic. Um, but thanks to internet trade, um, that allowed a lot of um, trade to continue taking place. What, what's quite interesting is even in countries where online sales are in single digits, if you look, for instance, at the percentage of the population that is engaged in buying something online, so I'm thinking here of countries like Tajikistan, Mongolia, Turkmenistan, even in those countries, many firms have actually moved their sales online. So there has been this enormous um, increase in digitalization. Mm. And is that so? Is that why you think the travel bans that we've seen across the world haven't really affected the, the global trade? because of the internet um, economy, you know, in a way. So the um, so trading relationships um, that have been, so travel bans matters for trade, if you think about um, need to start new trading relationships. So trading relationships um, that existed before, they survived. Um, one part that, you know, that I skip here, but perhaps um, let me come back to it, is that what we saw in the early stage of the pandemic, there was a lot of uncertainty um, related to 
if I'm an exporter, will I be paid by my foreign trader partner? Because there was a lot of uncertainty about which firms will survive, which firms will not survive. Demand for insurance um, went up and you could clearly see it in the data uh, that, for instance, trade flows that are insured by trade finance instruments, such as um, uh, trade flows using um, using letters of credit or using documentary collection actually experience no decline or very little decline while yeah. trades which are done on cash in advance meaning trades where there is prepayment required took a big hit yeah uh, okay yeah thanks Beata. i think we can move on there's, there's, there'll be more questions later on i think okay so let me move on and let me talk about um, a topic that's not very much on the radar screen of many people, but I think this is a topic that, um, that we should be paying attention to, namely state involvement in the economy. Um, so here, um, let me show you public perceptions of state state involvement in firms or industry. So these figures come from the world value surveys um, where people are asked, are you in favor of expanding the role of the state in firms and the economy? And you can see that in advanced economies over the last 20 years, there was growing support for public ownership. If you look at post-communist countries, the picture is very similar more and more people are keen on seeing greater role of the state in the economy. And, in, and you can see that this is more true of people who are older, but, act, but nevertheless, um, um, there was a substantial increase. If you look at emerging markets other than post-communist countries, support for pu expanding public ownership in the economy is more than 50%. Now, if history is any guide, we can expect that the pandemic will strengthen this trend. We know from academic research that previous epidemics dented people's trust in free market and democracy. We know that people who reached adulthood during a major recession have more positive view of public ownership and redistribution. And we also know that people who reached adulthood during past epidemics are more keen on expanding uh, public ownership. And, and here you see some figures. Basically, if your formative years, if you grew up during an epidemic, as an adult, you are, you are four percentage points more likely to support state role in the economy than somebody who didn't grow up during an epidemic. Um, and globally, if you look at people's perception, you see that people are much more keen on supporting democracy than private ownership. So here on the, uh, on the vertical axis, you see percentage of people surveyed in those world values survey who say living in a democracy is an, a good thing, it's an important thing. Um, and this is true of three quarters of people in most countries. Here you see that, that Lebanon is, is an exception. Now on the horizontal axis, you see percentage of people who believe that private ownership is important and should be expanded. You see that 70, more than three quarters of the population express this view only in a handful of countries. That's Japan, that's the US, that's Denmark, Switzerland. Um, but actually in many countries, and here red dots are uh, post-communist countries, the support for private ownership actually hovers around 50%. So what I expect to see is that as we are um, emerging from the pandemic, and as we will see a lot of firms struggling, governments will be extending help to firms. They will be coming to rescue firms. In some cases, that's going to happen because they will want to um, rescue firms that are systematically important for the 
economy system that have a systemic impact on the economy for instance um, that's what happened when we were rescuing the banking sector during the global financial crisis but now, governments may also want to rescue firms uh, in labor intensive circuit, sectors and we saw some taste of that already as governments came to help airlines and you know this greater involvement of state which may take the form of the state taking equity, equity stakes, or outright nationalizations will bring challenges. Right? The state is not very good at running firms. Um, there will be a question, will those companies will ever be returned to private hands? Uh, and of course, you know, in, in most countries, there will be a discussion, is the taxpayer going to get value for money? But, you know, this increased participation of the state is going to be very problematic in emerging markets where the rules governing state-owned enterprises are not very strong. So, for instance, here you see new data that was collected in the EBRD looking at laws and regulations that govern state-owned enterprises in post-communist countries. And you see that the picture is actually not very pretty. So, for instance, you see that even though um, about half or 60% of countries have provisions um, saying that um, state-owned enterprises should have an, a, a board, right, an independent board, in reality, many of these boards lack independence. Um, they don't, they are they don't have power to approve budgets. They don't have power to approve management. Um, you know, only in a fifth of countries, appointment process has anything to do in with merit. In many places, these appointments are purely political appointments. So the fact that these provisions are so weak means that state-owned enterprises may be subject to political interference. Moreover, in about half of post-communist countries, there are no rules that would guarantee separation between ownership of state enterprises and regulatory power. So basically, the ministry that owns a state-owned enterprise is the same ministry that regulates the sector. And, you know, in a fifth of countries, it's actually the SOE itself that has the power to regulate the sector. Obviously, that doesn't bode well for private sector. And if you look explicitly, are there rules that prevent uh, state-owned enterprises from getting preferential treatment in terms of subsidized credit, lower tax rate, buying inputs at subsidized rates from other SOEs? Those rules are present in less than a fifth of countries. So there is actually a real danger that as state uh, presence in the industry expands, that's going to tilt the playing field against the private sector. Now, let me say a few words about state-owned banks. Um, state-owned banks have been on the rise since the financial crisis. Here in this chart, you see the share of bank branches they account for in many countries. And you can see that in places such as Belarus, um, they account for more than 80% of branches. They are quite prevalent uh, in Russia, um, hugely important in Tajikistan, but they are also um, important in new EU member states in, in Turkey. So, What we observed since the global financial crisis is the huge increase in the assets of state-owned banks. Um, so here you see um, a graph which normalizes the size of assets in 2004 to 100. And you can see that private banks were expanding their assets until the about financial crisis, and then their assets have remained pretty much at the same level. At the same time, we saw huge increase in the assets owned by state banks. And in this graph, you see just post-communist countries, but if we did this, um, sort of globally, you would see the same picture. 
and state banks own more than half of banking assets in countries such as Belarus, Ukraine and Russia, but also in China and India. Why does it matter? Well, state banks um, have some advantages to them, meaning that there is a bright side to their activities. They have greater risk appetite, and that's something that's quite helpful uh, during difficult times. So for instance, what we saw is that during the global financial crisis, private banks retreated from extending loans. And that space that was created was filled by state-owned banks. State banks stepped in and were extending credit. And that, of course, helped to, helped to keep the economy going during the financial crisis. We also see, if you look at the loan level, as you see here uh, on data from Turkey, you see that state banks are less likely to require collateral. They are um, much more willing to give loans to firms without credit history, so young firms, startups, um, and they are willing to give those loans without uh, requiring collateral. So that's good news because they can help restart the economy. However, the bad news is that they can misallocate the credit due to political interference. Um, so basically what you see is that in many countries, governments use state, bank, uh, state banks to pump credit to places uh, where they hope to win elections. So here you see a study um, which looked at Turkey, which looked at Turkish municipalities where elections, local elections were closely fought. And here you see that in municipalities, um, where the local government was aligned with the central government one pr year prior to the elections, state banks were increasing credit massively. They were pumping money to those locations, while in municipalities where uh, the opposition party was in charge, state banks were withdrawing credit. Now, of course, this is not just something that's specific to Turkey. Um, this is something that has been documented in the context of India, in the context of Russia, also in the context of uh, German Landesbanken. So it matters because that shows that as the state presence in the banking sector increases, we are likely to see um, greater political interference which leads to misallocation of credit and translates in slower growth. Now, let me say um, a few words about the role of the state when it comes to green economy. Um, we saw yesterday good news. The United States rejoined the Paris Agreement. Um, if you look at emission targets that countries made in the context of the Paris Agreement, you see that for many emerging markets, for many post-communist countries, um, those commitments that were made lack ambition. So in this graph, you see what these commitments imply for GDP emission intensity. And you see that for many countries, GDP uh, emission intensity will go down, not always by a huge amount, but according to the commitments country may, countries made, emissions will go down. However, if you look at emissions in absolute terms, right, measured in megatons of CO2 equivalent, you see that for most emerging markets, um, these emissions will go up in absolute terms. So basically, um, what that means is that if we are serious about um, reducing um, the progress of, of climate change, we need to become more ambitious. So what we are likely to see is an increase in carbon prices. Basically, um, what we know is that, is that in order to achieve Paris Agreement goals, carbon price needs to be between uh, 40 and $80 per ton of CO2 equivalent. And this is between these two green lines, that's the range that we need to achieve 
Paris Agreement goals. Um, as you can see, most countries are way below. So what we are likely to see is um, increase in carbon prices, right? Europe has made very, um, very strong commitments to climate um, change mitigation efforts, as did the UK. Now, why does it matter for trade? It matters for trade because as you increase the carbon price um, in the European Union, for instance, you will need to prevent so-called carbon leakage. You will need to collect carbon adjustment tax at the border as imports are coming in. And um, it seems that introduction of such uh, carbon border adjustment tax would be compatible with the WTO rules. Change in the US administration makes um, that even more likely that um, you could do this. And that's going to matter very much for trade patterns, because, for instance, many uh, countries in the European neighborhood, particularly uh, post-communist countries, are very energy intensive when it comes to uh, their exports. So what you are likely to see is that there will be some countries in the European neighborhoods, think for instance, Albania, that may market themselves as clean energy hubs where it will be possible um, to produce goods using uh, clean technologies. And that's going to be one of the forces that's going to lead to reshaping of global value chains. So to close, um, the few messages I hope uh, the few messages that I hope you take away from the uh, from this lecture is that there will be some recovery in international trade in goods, but the volume will remain below pre-pandemic levels. Um, there will be most likely some gradual reshaping of global value chains as producers aim to build resilience through double sourcing. A lot of discussion has been about the so-called model China plus one, so buying from China as well as another country. Um, I would expect that remote work, which will persist, will lead to more trade in services. Um, well, I didn't touch much upon this, but I would think that you know multinational corporations will emerge much stronger from the crisis. Um, that's simply because they are uh, more resilient, they are more profitable, they have deeper pockets, so they are able to weather difficult times um, better. So I would expect to see some concentration, growing concentration of, of market power. Um, at the same time, there will be pressure to tax them as indebted governments looks for tax revenues. Um, the question that's sort of very much on my mind is, will greater presence of state on firms um, resulting from government interventions as governments come to rescue firms, will it tilt the playing field against private sector? So that's one space I would watch. And then finally, I would think that clean energy will be used by many countries as a source of comparative advantage and a way of attracting foreign investment. So let me stop here.